Hello, everybody. I'm happy you found hidden room number five. I'm here to talk about uh, usage of Spark with, uh, with Java. So I'm Alexandre Dubreuil. I'm a French Canadian uh, working in Paris for a company called Les Furets. Um, so Les Furets means the ferret in English. We don't sell animals, uh, fortunately. We do price comparison in the insurance business uh, we launched in 2012. So we do um, insurance comparison in car, motorcycle, housing, health, uh, and loan. Uh, there are some stats on what we do. We're approximately 25 developers. Um, and we ship our code to production every day. So to give you a bit of context on the data we have, um, we have a big form that looks like this. Uh, so the clients uh, fill, uh, fill the questions in our form. So this is my car here, BMW X5. No, I'm kidding. I don't have a car. Um, and then at the end, uh, we, sh we show a price comparison page um, with all the different prices for the different uh, insurance products. So behind the scenes, uh, we interrogate the web services of the insurers. Uh, they send back a quote. Um, and we show that to, to the end user. I'm giving you a bit of context because I'm going to work with, with an example later, and uh, it's, uh, the data comes from, uh, from that website. So what is interesting here is that the website can actually work without the database. So um, all the data we have in the database is only for analytics. So it's all the questions, it's all the prices we have. Um, so for that, we're migrating to a Lambda architecture. So there was some talk earlier about that. And this is really adapted to analytics. So this is adapted to what we do. Uh, so right now, we have a MySQL um, cluster that we're slowly migrating to, to Cassandra. This is the, the raw data part you see over there. And then we can use Spark on top of that for both the batch layer and the speed layer. Why is that? It's because Spark is a uh, batching engine, but it also do streaming. There is a Spark streaming that also does that. So how is the honeymoon working with Spark? So we started looking into different solutions for our Lambda architecture. Um, and we stumbled onto, onto Spark. So it's a general purpose uh, cluster computing engine. Why general purpose? It's more general than something like MapReduce. Uh, you can use it in Java, Scala, Python, or, or R. Um, and there's an engine that optimizes all those languages uh, in the same way. That's new uh, in Spark 2.0. Um, you have different tools in Spark. So you have Spark SQL, which is pretty powerful. You can just write SQL and Spark is going to um, execute it in, in, in the cluster. You have MLlib for machine learning. You have GraphX and you have Spark streaming for micro batching. Um, so it's not exactly streaming, but uh, it's, it's, it's almost full streaming. So when you look at Spark, you maybe you're vomiting rainbows, but um, the easiest way to start is to write Scala in a notebook. So uh, I started like that. So you write your, your, your Spark commands. So you're, this is uh, reading a CSV file, and then it's, uh, it's showing a table, and then doing other stuff. So this is very useful. Uh, this is a Databricks notebook. It's the easiest way to start uh, with Spark. Um, and then on Databricks, you can actually spawn uh, uh, machines in a cluster and you know, just uh, send your computation somewhere. Um, this is very nice. So in a notebook, you can uh, write statement in a read -evolve loop. So it, it keeps your context and it just executes your stuff. Um, you can you know, like show graphs and it's really easy and everything. And you can start instances, like I said. So this is pretty cool, right? Um, so we found lots of usage at Les Furets. Uh, we want to migrate to Lambda architecture. We want to generate performance report on demand. Um, we want to do business alerting with Spark Streaming. Um, and we want to classify user with machine learning. So like if you're 20 years old, are you gonna buy, are you gonna buy insurance for uh, ABMW or something else? 
And the only problem is that the notebooks are in Scala. And I have nothing against Scala. The thing is, we're uh, full stack Java developers uh, at Lifure. So, you know, we kind of want to reuse our Java tooling and uh, we want to use the Java API in Spark. Um, the other thing is, uh, a notebook is fine for prototyping, but it's not industrial. So, what do we want as uh, full stack Java developers? We want code version in Git. We want continuous integration in Jenkins. Uh, we want to use GUnit to do our testing because, yes, we want to test our uh, Spark code. We want to reuse our code base. So this is uh, with something called UDF, so user-defined function, uh, where you can call your own code um, uh, in, in, in Spark, right? And we want to be able to launch um, our Spark code in our IDE, so IntelliJ or Eclipse, uh, and Maven, right? We want to be able to start Spark with, uh, with Maven. So, how does that work in real life? Um, well, the first step is just to add a dependency in Maven. Uh, so, you're adding uh, Spark Core, uh, which is kind of historic Spark, so Spark 1.6. Um, that's version 2.0, it's 2.1 now. And the part that is in yellow there is it's because um, Spark was compiled with Scala, and it's compiled with Scala 2.11. It's important only because when you compile your code, when you're gonna uh, push that into your Spark cluster, your Spark cluster needs to have the same version uh, of Scala installed, or else you're gonna have serialization problems. And then the other important part is the data frame API. So I'm gonna talk solely of the data frame API today, because I feel like without that, it's very hard to use Spark uh, in Java. So you need that. Uh, it's, it's placed in the SQL package. I have no idea why, but you know, it's there. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like together. So this is an overview of the different bricks you have in, in Spark. So you have Spark Core, on top of that, the data frame API, which I think is necessary to use it uh, with Java. And then the other bricks are different imports. So we're importing SQL. Uh, there is streaming, it's another dependency, uh, MLlib, graphics, and other stuff. And then you get for free those four languages up top. And then you have connectors. So you have backend stores. Uh, which are your data source, right? And you have like Hadoop, Cassandra, HBase, uh, and everything uh, you need. So we're using MySQL, and you were, you we're using the Cassandra connector too. It works pretty well. Uh, in the code I'm gonna, I'm gonna show, there are some examples with Cassandra. Uh, yeah. So uh, what is your entry point? So how do you start Spark? Uh, you start by creating a new Spark session. So uh, there's a builder, and the only thing you need to pass is the master. That means uh, where is your actual Spark cluster? So you do Spark session dot builder, and you pass the master. Uh, I'm using local here. It means uh, I don't have a Spark cluster, but start one for me. So it's kind of a dev mode. It starts a cluster for you, and the star means, if I remember correctly, like um, uh, start one executor per core. Uh, and then I wrote the smallest main I could, I could write, uh, empty data frame, and I'm just uh, showing that. So this is uh, the um, smallest example I could, I could write. So just a bit on, of context on, on the cluster. The thing that um, instantiates the Spark context, well, the Spark session, actually, uh, is called the driver. So the code I was, so this is the driver, okay? Um, and then uh, the driver contains the program and uh, the execution context, and uh, that is in a jar, and it gets sent to the workers uh, via the cluster manager. So you have an arbitrary number of workers, and in the workers you have executors, and in that you have task. You can, um, a task is like a thread. Uh, and when you start in local mode, uh, the driver and the worker are on the same uh, JVM. And if you start in cluster mode, then it's on separate, separated GM, uh, GVM. Mm -hmm. 
So that means that the jar containing your program is sent by the cluster manager, so that can be the standalone cluster manager which is shipped with Spark. It can be any cluster manager, so like uh, Apache Mesos or Yarn. Um, and that means the data are serialized uh, between the workers. That means your data needs to be serializable, and that also means that if you have a variable in your driver, you don't have access to that um, in, in, in your driver, unless you broadcast them. So I'm going to do uh, an example. So um, we're in the insurance business, so we have different products. Uh, we have different insurers, and I want to find the mean price by product for an insurer. So this is a small data set that I extracted uh, recently. Uh, where is my cursor? Yeah, it's there. Um, so you have like uh, date, time, module, because we do auto, moto, things like that. You have the product, the price, and the insurer. So it's, it looks like this. Um, the product, it's an int. Uh, you have the price, it's a double. And you have your call insurer, which is the name of, of the insurer. So I'm going to create a new class here. Uh, prices run. So what is our entry point? Um, it's a Spark session. Oh yeah, something I didn't, I, I didn't tell you about. Um, from Spark 2.0, your, your entry point is Spark session. In some all older documentation, you're going to see um, Spark context. This is the old way of starting Spark. It's like 1.6 and before, it's Spark context, and 2.0 and after, it's Spark session. If you're using the data frame API, you need to use Spark session, because or else you're never going to get um, data frame. So I'm using the builder. Spark session that builder. Uh, I need to pass the master, which is local star, and then I call get or create. So um, I'm just gonna do a main, and then what I want to do is I I want to load my CSV. So I'm gonna call a method. Uh, called read on Spark, and then I can call CSV. I'm just going to pass some option. Uh, there's a header, so like uh, column names, and I want to do something uh, called infer schema that are going to try, well, Spark is going to try to guess the different uh, data types of the columns. So I do uh, read CSV, and then I prepare the path, uh, prices, CSV, that's it. Um, so we're just going to see what, what, is, uh, what is inside that. So there are two methods to do that. There is show and then there is uh, print schema too. So as you can see, I'm, I'm just in IntelliJ. I have nothing else than just the import in my PUM, and you can uh, start Spark in like three minutes. I haven't shown the, the, the PUM.xml, but there's pretty much nothing in it. You know, there's like two dependencies here. There's actually two dependencies here, which are important, and nothing else. So you can start using Spark right now um, with your favorite uh, IDE. So, what was shown is the parsed CSV in columns, so it's column oriented, um, and the types were correctly inferred. So I have integer, uh, double, and string. Double is important because I'm going to do an average after. So I have that class uh, data set of row. Um, so what I want to do on it, I want to filter for one insurer. So how do you do that in Java? Well, you can pass those uh, different class. So you have filter function or you have a column. So you can either do new uh, filter function. And what you receive is a row. So you receive the full row. And I want to filter on the column uh, insurer. So I do row, get as, and then uh, field name is insured, that's the name of, of my column, and I, do, I, I say equals uh, cool insurer. 
So what we don't see actually is that um, you pass the type here, right? You pass the type uh, string. It's, it's inferred, so I can remove it. Um, you can use lambdas, which is cool. Which is going to break like that. And the other way of using uh, the other way of using a filter uh, is by using a column. So there's a package called, well, it's a uh, Scala class. It's called function, and there's lots of very useful things in it. And there's something called uh, call. And then you can reference uh, the column insures, and then on that you have uh, things like greater than, equals, things like that. So it's actually shorter to write it like that, so I'm going to do equals null safe. Um, I could do just, you know, equal, normal. Um, and you can uh, import that to be a little bit shorter. So I filtered on my insure. Um, what else do I want to do? Well, I want to group by product for that insurer. So I'm going to call the method group by. Um, what does this take? Uh, well, the product column. No? And group by returns a special, um, returns a special uh, object, uh, which is called like uh, aggregate data set. And on that, you have special methods, uh, like the method aggregate. Um, that aggregates on something. So I'm going to do function dot average of the column price, and I'm going to rename that. There is a as uh, function on the column um, on the column class, and I'm going to rename that average. So I'm just going to print that to see uh, what it does. So we have a new aggregate data set. I'm going to do show and I'm going to print the schema. Um, so we have our average by product. So this is the, the group by with the average. Uh, it's working well. It's just not sorted. And uh, we have one, two, three. So it's not very interesting in terms of um, domain model, right? We can do better than that. So we have uh, something called a UDF. So it's a user defined function. So you need to register your um, your UDF when you spark when you start your your Spark cluster. So you do register, and then you pass a name. I'm going to call that readable product, so like human readable product. And then next argument is UDF uh, with the number of parameters you want to pass. So I'm just going to do UDF1, and I'm going to convert my int into a string. Uh, so integer to string. So I, I get the integer, and I prepare the class, which is called product mapper. And on product mapper, I have um, I have a, a method called English that returns uh, the English string from an integer, right? I, I I go to string, and then I just need to pass the data type data types dot string. This is what I'm returning. Again, uh, which is nice, we have. Uh, we have lambdas, so I'm converting that to lambda. And we can also just use a method reference. So what is interesting in that is the, the process is going to get executed on the workers. Um, but all the workers have access to the, your user-defined functions. And those user-defined functions are your domain model um, functions, which is very useful to bind um, spark with your with your domain code so now now I have my um, my function I can use it I do aggregate and then I do something called uh, with column with column you can add a new column or you can replace one so I'm gonna add a new one uh, readable product and then in functions in the class function you have something called UDF I'm just going to return the line here. Uh, readable product. And then you need to, to tell uh, on what column that works. And it works on the product column. Uh, 
I'm just going to order by uh, I'm going to order by average uh, descending to have the biggest price up top. Um, so that's a new data set. I'm just going to show it from schema. So, um, the, the most pricey is up there. It's called comprehensive luxury. That's very good. So, um, we've done a small exercise here. Returning to the presentation. Now we see everybody. Yeah, that's good. So, what is executed on the worker and what is executed on the driver? So, you have the, the Spark, um, the Spark, um, uh, variable is a Spark session, so it's on the driver, right? Uh, and then you have read and CSV, but that's executed on the worker. So your workers need to have access to um, to the path uh, you've given. So it's good to have like HDFS or things like that. Um, and then the filter is also executed on the worker, the group by, the aggregate column called UDF. So you get the point, right? Everything is uh, executed on a worker, but when you do show, um, the information gets uh, returned to the driver to be shown to you in your in your GVM, right? So you think Java eight streams is pretty much the same the same thing because all the things uh, that are in blue are not executed. It's all lazy. It's ex executed when you do uh, when you do show. So yeah, between each step. Uh, it's important to know that there's going to be shuffles. So the data gets transferred between each worker um, uh, between the steps. So between like filter and group by, there's going to be a shuffle between the worker. And Spark optimizes your, execu your, exe your execution plan uh, based uh, to reduce actually the shuffles because your network time is... Uh, is the harder to, to optimize. Well, it's, it's the longer, right? So you can see the shuffles in something called Spark UI. So when you start a new job, you're going to have something like that. Uh, you, can persist, um, you can persist that and uh, see it after. So you see the different stages, and you see when it's written uh, exchange, uh, it's because there was a, a shuffle, but you see the different, uh, different steps of the computations. So I've talked about data set. That's a, a class um, that can be, can, can be also called data frame. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's almost. Um, so a data frame is a typed and name column oriented distributed collection of, of data. Um, it's based on RDDs, which is like the art the heart of Spark. I'm going to talk about that later. And DataFrame is the, the new API. And it's represented by the class dataset. It's a bit um, confusing because two different things is dataset and DataFrame, uh, but it's the same class in Java. If you're using Scala, there's an alias. So there's actually an alias called DataFrame. So we say DataFrame when it's a dataset of row. So data set of row is an untyped, um, an untyped, uh, untyped data set. So normally when you use Spark Session, you get a data set of row, which is just a data frame, right? So that's what we used in, in our example. So it's not because it's untyped that there's no schema. So every data set has a schema. So this is the one we saw. And when you do print schema, you can, you can actually see it. Um, so when you're using Spark SQL or anything with Spark Session and Spark 2.0, you're using uh, DataFrame. Uh, all of that, it's that part here. It's optimized by Catalyst, and it's optimized to RDDs, which is, which is the underlying uh, data structure. And that underlying data structure uh, is the, the part where it's distributed and resilient. 
So what's the difference uh, between a typed and untyped data set? Well, you can actually do a data set of questions. So at Lifure, we ask questions to our users. We have a Java bean, which is called question, and we can do a data set of questions. So what is the use? Well, in the example um, here in, in the filter, I was doing uh, row dot get as uh, dot equals something. Well, the get as here, uh, you need to pass uh, the type. Well, now it's inferred, but in general, it's, it's, uh, you need to pass it. So how do you know that uh, that column is actually a string? And when you do refactor, uh, refactoring, uh, you might get confused on that. Not only that, but there's no semantics. Uh, it's not get ensures, it's get as something. So if your column is kind of not well named, um, it's not very nice to read. So you can actually type your data set with a Java bean. So you do uh, data, which is a data, data set of row, and you do as, uh, as a data set of question. So now Sparks, uh, Spark speaks your domain model language. So it's pretty powerful to be able to do queries on your actual domain model. Uh, so a bit of history, so I was talking about RDDs, this is the core of Spark, they launched the Data Frame API in 2012 and the Dataset API in 2015. Uh, there's a bit of overhead uh, on the Dataset API with the types, um, but it's the cost to pay to have uh, a type, -safe, um, a type safe domain model. So I'm just going to talk uh, a bit about RDDs because it's important. Um, sometimes you need to use them. Uh, not everything is in the data frame API. There are some things that are still in the RDD API and something we use at Le Fure is partitioned by uh, because we, our backend store is, uh, is, is sharded. It's, uh, it's Cassandra, right? And um, Spark can know how the sharding is done, but sometimes you have to be explicit about it. Uh, so you use RDD uh, partition by for that. Uh, that's one example, but there are, uh, there are others. So how do you switch from RDD API to data frame API? It's pretty easy on your, um, uh, on your data frame. Uh, you have a method called RDD. If you're in Java, it's kind of a pain because uh, you need to use Java RDD sometimes because some methods are more usable on that class. RDD was really designed for Scala. So um, if you have to use RDD, use Java RDD. Uh, and then you can switch back to the data frame API. Um, you use uh, Spark session and then you do create data frame, you pass your RDD, and then you need to add uh, the structure as I said, um, data frame have, um, have a schema, and you need to pass that because RDD doesn't. Um, yeah. So just a bit about the optimization. So Catalyst uh, will optimize your execution plan. You can see that by doing dataset.explain. I'm going to show it just after. Um, Basically, it does whole stage code gen, so it's a very optimized way of co-generating uh, RDDs. So you're using data frames. Uh, what Catalyst does is that it co-generates uh, Scala RDDs uh, under the hood. Uh, if you're using Python or Java, it's like 10 times faster uh, to use data frame uh, than uh, handwritten RDDs. So, um, what if we test our code? So I'm just going to see, I'm just going to show you uh, the, um, the execution plan that is optimized by Catalyst, just to see. So this is uh, the different plans. So uh, it parsed that one, analyzed, optimized, and then this, this is a physical plan. So it's going to read the CSV, uh, do two filters because I wrote two, and then partial average, full average, and then exchange, so bring back uh, the stuff in one place and then sort it. 
Okay, so let's test the code. Um, we're not going to test the CSV uh, reading. I'm going to remove that. So I'm going to extract method here. Uh, average price. Make that public. Um, and I'm going to return the, uh, the data set so that I can test it. Right. So I'm creating my test. Um, I'm going to use an annotation called uh, Spark Test that we created at Lefure. It it starts a um, it starts a Spark cluster in local at the beginning of the test, and it reuses the same. So you don't pay the cost of um, of spawning the cluster uh, in the beginning. Uh, this is a, a GUnit 5 uh, annotation, but we also have the GUnit uh, 4 annotation because it's it used to be a rule, and now it's an extension. It's not the same thing. So I do uh, public Spark session uh, Spark. So this is going to get uh, going to be injected by the um, uh, by the extension. So I do a before. So what is the method we're going to call? We want to create a test data set instead of reading the CSV. Pass that to our method and then test back the results. So there's uh, a method called create data frame that takes something like that. So we're going to use a list of row and a struct type. I find it the, easy, the easiest way to, to do. So um, we're going to use something called row factory. And a row factory uh, creates a row. And you just have to pass the column values. Uh, when you create a data set, you don't have to create everything. You, don't ha you just have to create um, the columns you're using in your actual function. So here, we're using product, price, and insure, but you're, we're not using like date or UID. So I don't have to create everything. Um, so first column is the product. So I'm going to use product one, the price, and then the insurer. Um, I'm going to do another product one, uh, just so I have an easier average. I'm going to do that. And then let's say product two at 50 bucks. So that's my test uh, data set. I have my rows. Now I need to create the, the, the structure type because a data, data frame is structured. So there's a class called, called struct field, and it takes a name. So my first column is product uh, of type uh, int. And then submit a data, so nullable, false. That's not important. Metadata empty. So I'm doing that for my three columns. Uh, the second one is price. It's a double. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the last one is insure. And last thing I need to do is just create my new data frame. So I have my rows, and then um, rows, and then I pass my uh, struct type. That takes a list of struct field, product, price, insurer. Um, so this is my test data. I'm just going to. Uh, call it prices. So now I can write my test. Uh, okay, so what is the method I want to call? I want to call uh, devox price run. 
average price and then pass uh, my CSV or my, my data set. Uh, so I get return and average price. How do you test your data set? Well, you just have to use uh, JUnit. So assertion, assert equals. I'm going to test the product. So which one is going to be the most expensive? We have one, one. At those price, so it's going to be one. Um, so I can use something uh, called first because my data set is ordered. Uh, in general, you probably are going to use something like take that returns uh, like the first n elements, for example. Uh, you can also iterate on, uh, on your data set. I'm, I'm going to show that after. So first, and then I'm going to go get uh, the good column to test. So it's product. Integer, yeah. I have some casting to do because it's Java. So is um, my most expensive product one? Yes, my test passes. Um, what else can I test? Well, I can test that the average is uh, 85, which is uh, good to test. Get as and then average. Um, so you can also do distributed assertion because you're in Spark. Uh, you have a data set uh, that is distributed, so you can do average price for each, and then you do a new for each function. And inside that, I can do I can do my assertion. I can do assert not null row dot uh, get as and then um, like readable product, for instance. So what I'm doing now is that I'm asking uh, the executors uh, to, uh, to make the assertion in a distributed fashion. So those here are executed on the driver, but this one is executed on uh, the different uh, executors. Uh, okay. So some guidelines we're using uh, at Lifure. So uh, test startup. So we start um, we start the worker before the, the workers. Well, we start Spark before the test, and we re we reuse uh, the same instance. Uh, the test mode is it's better to use the standalone mode. So to use an actual Spark cluster, because if you're using if you're using only the local mode, it means you're not testing the serialization uh, of your data between the GVMs. So that, it, that's important to, to do stand, stand alone mode too. Uh, the thing is, uh, if, you, you're, if you're using a test cluster, sometimes you're offline and you don't, you don't have an access to that. So you might want to start one with Maven before your test, uh, but it, it takes time. So you can work uh, on in both mode, so local mode for local development, and then in your CI, use something like uh, standalone. So is the Java API uh, limited compared to Scala? Uh, yes, it's, it's a little limited. So when you think of uh, a Java notebook that we would like to have but we don't, uh, there is a read eval print loop in Scala which is very useful. Um, we don't have that in Java. It might come in Java 9 uh, and be usable in, no in a notebook, but it's not. Uh, so you can still prototype with Scala because it's the same API, but it's not exactly the same. Um, Java API is harder to learn. Uh, there's not a lot of documentation. Uh, it's mostly why I'm doing this talk. There's lots of talk on Spark. There's not a lot of talk or blog posts on Spark with uh, Java. It's very easy to do verbose implementation, so I'm going to show one just after. Uh, and there are types, uh, there are types everywhere. Um, so this is my first implementation, sorry, of, uh, of word count. Um, so here, uh, I'm, I'm having a line, uh, well, a row, and in that row, there are, it's a full line of text. So I'm splitting on the space and then uh, returning a flat map. 
And then I'm using tuple two uh, to count uh, on the right side of the equation, one, and then I group by and I sum on that column. That's very verbose. Not only that, but all the, um, all the lambdas, I need to cast them in, in the proper type. Um, I'd say when you know the API, you're gonna, wor you're gonna write the word count like this, but it feels a bit magical. So um, here the split uh, is gonna actually uh, create an array, uh, an array type in one column, and then the explode is gonna take the column element and it's gonna flip it and create new lines, create new rows in your data set. So this is magical, but it's kind of, it's kind of nice. But uh, those functions are not especially well documented. So split and explode, they are in the functions uh, class that I shown before. You know, the one that contains uh, column and everything. So when you know the API, uh, it's easier to write clean code in the same way that, um, in the same way that here, the filter function, I can write it like this, or I can write it like this. So I'll let you choose which one is, is easier. So as I said, lots of functions you're gonna need are in the functions uh, package, like split and explode. Uh, it's for all the functions uh, that, takes, um, that takes column. Something I haven't said during the demo is, actually uh, something like average. It's a function in the functions package, uh, but what it does is that it returns a column. So pretty much everything uh, in Spark in the data frame API is a column. So the average here uh, is actually returning a column. So unfortunately, I find the Java 8 lambdas uh, kind of annoying to, to use because you need to cast them. Uh, so normally, you should be able to write it like that because type inference in Java should work, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, the reason for that is there is a incompatibility between uh, the compilation, the resulting compilation of Scala um, and the usage uh, of those methods in Java, uh, it's just because all the, all the functions are overloaded. So when you, when you check the signature, you have filter function and you have function one, uh, and actually Java cannot make the difference between the two. Um, it's actually a hard problem that is solved in Scala 2.12 but the support of that version of Scala is very hard, so actually Spark uh, has not caught up yet. There are two, um, there are two bugs uh, on the Spark uh, gyra for that. Um, I haven't talked about it, but there are type serializer uh, everywhere in Java, so here I'm using group by key to find uh, the biggest element uh, in a group and uh, the group by key will always take a serializer for the right side of the operation. So it's easy here because it's a string, but sometimes you have like uh, objects or tuples and it gets uh, very annoy annoying uh, to pass that. Uh, in Scala, it's just inferred. So some things we didn't talk about. Well, Spark streaming. Um, the API is really similar, but it's kind of different it's harder to use in Java. Uh, you can kind of write the same code in streaming, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, Cassandra connector, uh, you need to use RDDs if you're doing joins uh, between tables. So there's no joins in Cassandra, but there is in, in Spark, right? Uh, if you want to make that efficiently, you'll have to use RDDs. Uh, and also to give partitioning information, I've, I've said that before. Uh, and then I didn't talk about the RDD API. It's tuple oriented. And tuples in Java are, is, is really a pain because you don't have those uh, Scala constructs where you can go and find very easily uh, the part you want in, in, in the tuple. Uh, all that can be avoided with the data frame API um, mo most of the time. So in conclusion, uh, does Spark fit in a uh, Java ecosystem? Uh, yes, with the data frame API, I'd say only. It's testable with any t t uh, unit testing framework. 
uh, it's launchable from Maven and uh, your IDE. Um, it's strongly typed, and we like that with a question mark. Uh, I think we do most of the time. Uh, sometimes it's just a pain, but you know, it's Java, so. Um, it integrates with our code base with two things, UDF, so user-defined functions, and because you can uh, reuse your Java beans and, and, type, your, and type your rows. Uh, and it supports declarative Java 8 style. Uh, if you know streams, you're not going to be lost at all. It's the same construct, so it's very useful to see it like this. So uh, Java is coolest API. Yeah, I think it's coolest API. Uh, some documentation, so uh, those slides and the code are on the Lefure GitHub. Uh, there's also the Spark annotations I've shown. And there are f articles in French, I'm not sure anybody speaks French here. Uh, but we have a technical blog at Lefure. And I wrote an uh, in-depth article about uh, what, I, what, I said, what I said today. So that's it for me, thank you very much.